Hey everybody, it's Jimmy from the DIY and Digital, and today we are starting MRR1. Welcome back everybody. First of all, if you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, hit that bell icon so you don't miss any updates like this video. So first of all, welcome to my new space. Um, I've been working on this. It's still not complete, but it is a work in progress and I am very close to having this completely done. So today is a big video for me. Today is the beginning of something that I've wanted to do ever since I started this YouTube channel a little less than two and a half years ago. And that is a project railroad, but not just any project railroad. I have had an idea for a railroad called MRR1. And that is because when a lot of people get into the hobby, they can find some guidance, but they really don't know where to start. They don't get to see really how to do that. And they don't really get to experiment and they kind of have to go at it alone. What I wanted to do was to build a railroad along with you that required the least amount of tools possible that could fit in most people's available space and would be fun to run for a while, but would also be expandable for when you want to be able to grow your model railroad. So MRR1 basically is a two foot by four foot in scale layout that uses Kato Unitrack and it has all DIY electronics and thanks to my experimentation and learning of 3D printing has all 3D printed buildings that are all either already available in my Etsy store or will be available in my Etsy store. And it uses as much off the shelf stuff as possible and the stuff that I need to modify, I will show you how to do this in these tutorials. And this is gonna last about a month and a half on and off. Um, probably every other week you're gonna see one with the reveal of MRR1 in January of 2021. So let's go ahead and go to the computer and check out the 3D renderings of what MRR1 is going to look like. This is MRR1. It is a two foot by four foot in scale layout. It has a town scene, a station, and two industrial sidings, along with a hillside for some scenery. Let's take a tour. Coming off the main line, you first pass the little station for the town. You then cross over a double grade crossing. You then round a turn through the town and go across another curved grade crossing. Now we pass the industrial sidings, and there are two of those, so you can either have two smaller industries or one large industry. We then head to the second turn through the scenic section of the layout there will be a gravel grade crossing somewhere in here. And now we're back to the station. The layout will be built with Kato Unitrack with a mainline radius of 9.75 inches. I chose this because this is the smallest radii that Kato says six axle diesels can use. And all of the parts for this layout will be linked in the description below. So that's MRR1. It's gonna be a lot of fun to build. Today we're going to be doing the bench work and we're going to be getting everything set up for the next tutorial, which is going to be putting in electronics and installing track. So let's go ahead and get started. The bench work for this layout is extremely simple. All you need is a two foot by four foot section of quarter inch underlayment, two one by four pine boards, and some two inch wood screws. Here's a complete list of the tools and supplies for everything we are doing in this video. The only tools you need to assemble this bench work is a drill with a full set of drill bits, including some spade bits, a speed square, and a tape measure. If you want to cut the lumber yourself, a small circular saw is required, but you can usually have the home improvement store you buy these from cut them for you. 
I was able to purchase the two foot by four foot underlayment section pre-cut from my local home improvement store. If you intend to cut the lumber yourself, here is what you do. First, mark the length you'll need to cut for the four foot side of the board first. Then mark your cut line. I used a speed square and I actually scored the line rather than cutting it using an X-Acto knife, but you can use a pencil or pen or anything to mark it. Now it's time to make the first cut. We double check the measurement of the first cut board and use it as a template to cut the second board. Now we have the four foot sides. I'm using a clamp to hold the board in place while I attach it. If you don't have clamps, get someone to help you hold the board in place. I then drill pilot holes for the screws. Normally when I build bench work, I use wood glue and a nail gun, but since a lot of people don't have access to a nail gun, I wanted to use screws for this build. I drill four pilot holes about one foot apart, and then I attach the screws, doing four screws total across the side of the board. I then repeat the process on the other side. Now it's time for the ends and the cross beam. I grab the second one by four and mark where I need to cut. I measure these, but I also use the space in between the two long boards, which is where the board will fit, to mark my cut lines. I then cut the first board. This ended up being a pretty snug fit, so I did end up using a hammer to get it into place. But this is optional. I then drill the pilot holes and attach the screws. I then repeat the process on the other side. Once the boards are attached to the long sides, I attach them to the underlayment using the same process. Now it's time for the support beams. I want pass-throughs for wires, so I use a one inch spade bit to cut two holes in each cross beam about six inches from each edge. I then measure 16 inches and line up the cross beams. This will give me three even chambers for wiring underneath the layout. I then measure carefully and put one screw into each beam through the top of the underlayment. And there is our raw bench work. Now it's time to put some foam on. I am using one inch extruded foam project boards. You can buy these in two foot by two foot sections from home improvement stores like the Home Depot. To attach them, I will be using simple latex caulk. You can see that I am using it in a caulk gun, but you can buy latex caulk in a simple tube that you can squeeze by hand. I line them up to make sure they are even, 
and then I weigh them down and let them dry overnight. It may take longer to dry depending on the humidity of your environment that you are building in. If you want to be safe, wait two days. And there is our layout base ready to be turned into a model railroad. Now we need to begin drilling holes for our electrical work. We start by laying out our track plan so that we can see where we need to put terrain and place feeders and drill holes. I like to do this before any painting is done so that there's a minimal pink foam exposure after I've painted. Once I've laid out the track, I can mark where I need power feeders to be at. This is going to be a DCC layout, so the track feeders will be attached to a single bus. I also place buildings roughly to see where I need to drill holes for lighting. I then begin marking places to drill holes in the foam. I then remove everything and drill all of the required holes. I then flip the board on its side and clean up the drill holes. I also mark the holes clearly with a pen. I then use a 2 inch Forstner bit to cut a hole for the power cable, but this is optional as it only helps you to level the table by not having the power cord sitting underneath it. And I will be attaching a power strip to power everything underneath the layout. The last thing I will do before I begin any painting or additional electrical work is sand the foam top to rough it up for paint. And there you go, we have a solid base to build our layout upon. I start this episode by returning the track to the layout. Then using foam project boards, I lay them out to cut the hillside. I score them in the shapes that I want using a knife and snap them apart. I repeat this process for every part of the terrain. Once this is done, I use some latex caulk to glue all of the foam in place. I then weigh it down and let it dry overnight. Here is our finished result. I do a bit of sanding to smooth out some of the edges, but much of this will be covered so I don't do too much. Now it's time to paint this. I'm using simple household paint as my base color, and there's no need to spring for the expensive stuff. I paint the entire layout a simple brown color. You'll want to go select the brown you want from your local paint store. This will help hide any imperfections that may show up that scenery doesn't get just right. Once I'm done, I let it dry overnight to make sure that it's good to go. Now that it's dry, I can begin the fun part. I bring all of the track back in, but this time it's for good. I start to pull wires that are already attached and prepped through the holes that I had marked and drilled. Next, I bring in the rest of the track and connect it all up. Mm -hmm. 
Once everything is connected, I do a short DC test run to make sure there's no kinks in the physical track. Now it's time to attach some feeders. These feeders will be needed every place that a turnout can isolate the track from the main power. We will be using Kato terminal unijoiners to connect the track to power. These use wires soldered to the unijoiners to supply the power, and they are very low profile. Make sure that all of your wires are on the same side to avoid short circuits. I will be placing white on the outer rail and blue on the inner rail. Now it's time to hook them up. They install like any other unijoiner. I use the little blue provided tool to remove the old unijoiners and replace them with the terminal unijoiners. And now it's time to thread the wire through the base. You will have to cut the connector off of the end of the wire for this. If you would like to use the connector, just make sure to leave enough extra wire on the end that you cut so that it can be easily attached, or you can purchase new connectors. These are Tamiya connectors and can be found on Amazon. I'll link them below. Once that is done, I repeat the process for all of the feeders. Now that the feeders are done, I once again break out the latex caulk to secure the track in place. For track like Kato Unitrack with pre-installed road beds, you'll want to put a small blob of caulk underneath each connection point since this is the largest point of contact between the track and the base. Once you're done, you'll weigh it down and, you guessed it, let the track dry overnight. Now that the track is dry, we can wire up the DCC bus. This will supply power to the entire layout. This method essentially hooks up the layout in parallel rather than a single point of connection. This way, one spot of electrical failure won't stop the entire layout. We will be using one of these buses from EVE model that is specifically designed for model railroading. It allows us to connect track power and use screw terminals to connect all of the wires. It even comes with the spacers and screws to attach this to your base. Once we've attached this to the layout, it's time to connect all of our feeders. We strip each wire end and attach them to the bus, making sure that all of the wires match. So all of the white ones are on one side and all of the blue ones are on another. It does not matter which side is which, just make sure that each side is the same. Once we are done, we're going to want to do some simple wire management. I will be using a cheap staple gun with U-staples and some zip ties to neaten up all these wires. And you'll have to do this pretty much custom based on how much wire you use and where you want wires to run. Now for the DCC system. I will be installing a DCC++ system on this layout. If you already have a DCC system purchased, you can go ahead and skip this section. But if you want to build a DCC system from scratch, keep watching. You can see how I build one of these in the link at the top or in the description below. We will also be using a Raspberry Pi 3 to control the system using JMRI. Now this may sound complicated, but JMRI has made this extremely easy with a Linux disk image that automatically starts JMRI and its Y-Throttle server so you can control it from your phone. 
The first thing that you will need to do is take the micro SD card that you're using as the Pi's hard drive and format it to FAT32. Next, you will need to download what is called a disk image. Basically, this is the file containing our computer's operating structure. I know that sounds intense, but it's really not. First, we go to jmri.org and click the latest production release. We then click the Raspberry Pi OS link in the left column. This will take you to a download page. You will then see a section called Pre-built Image Available, and then a link labeled here. Click that link and it will take you to a new web page where the actual download link is. Under the software image, you will need two things. The first is the latest software image, which is right here. The second is a program to flash the disk image to your drive. The website has two links, Win32 Disk Imager and Belina Etcher. Both work. I used Win32 because I ended up having some problems with Belina. Once you have the software downloaded, you will need to install whichever disk flasher you chose. And if you're running Win32, go ahead and extract the zipped disk image file for JMRI. Once you have done this, go ahead and make sure that your SD card that you're using with the Raspberry Pi is hooked up to the computer, and then you want to find the extracted file with your JMRI disk image. It's more than likely in the downloads folder where the original file that you downloaded is as well. You'll then select your image file from that extracted file, and then your destination, which is the SD card, and then you flash the image to the drive. To set this up the first time, you're going to want to go ahead and hook up your Raspberry Pi to a monitor, keyboard, and mouse. You only have to do this the first time. This particular software will automatically bring up JMRI once it boots. Then you just go in and set up JMRI to run DCC++. I've done this in a previous tutorial and I'll link that right up here as well as in the description below. You'll also want to have the Arduino Uno or Mega you are using for your base station connected to the Raspberry Pi during setup. Now you can install the Raspberry Pi onto the layout. And then install the Raspberry Pi using just two command strips. Once this is all done, you can connect the DCC++ base station to the layout. I use two number eight one inch screws. I then manually thread them through the holes on the Arduino Uno opposite the power connections. I then carefully drill them into the base. I then reattach the motor shield. Notice that I'm using a DC plug adapter on my motor shield. This makes plugging it in a lot easier. I will link these in the description below. Next, I connect my main track power line to the DCC bus. And you can see I'm using these little connectors. The reason that I'm doing this is if I ever want this to be a module of a larger layout, I can plug this into the DCC bus of another layout rather than using its own. I then connect the USB wire from the base station to the Raspberry Pi. I then connect all of the power up and we are ready to go. I go through the Engine Driver app on my Android phone to power up the base station and test. The Raspberry Pi generates its own Wi-Fi network, and you connect your device to it to control the layout. Now it's time for a first test run. I go through and test all of the different points. And that's it. We now have a DCC layout capable of running a train. If you need to learn how to program a locomotive in JMRI, here's a link to a tutorial that I did on that. 
All you need to do is hook up a monitor, mouse, and keyboard to the Pi and run through the programming process. If you need to hook up a programming track, simply connect the track to the B motor terminals on the DCC++ base station motor shield. In order to begin any real scenic track work, we need to get the grade crossings in place. For this, I will be using Blair Line's wood grade crossings. These are reasonably priced and look great. If you would like to make your own DIY crossings, I have two ways I have done in past videos. I will link those below. I start by making a wash of India ink and brown paint. Now I really mix this to where it's just to my liking. I then dab the crossings using a foam brush dipped in the mixture. This is really just to give the wood a slightly aged look before we install them. Now we test fit the pieces. The curves I'm using are for nine and three quarter inch radius track. I run a car over them with my hand to make sure that they fit. And now I just take some simple white glue and set the centerpiece in place. Once it is dry, I test it again to make sure that it still works. I repeat this process all over the layout. I have four total crossings, including one double crossing, which has two of those. Now it's time for the roads. And for the roads, I just use spackle for this. It's a very, very simple and very, very inexpensive material to use, and you don't need much of it to make good roads. I start by scoring the rough path of the road using my building placements for reference. I plan on placing and painting the road before any scenery is put down. I use the Blair line pieces that the crossing came in as a template for road width. Now it's time for the spackle itself. And you'll want to stir it up since it tends to settle a little bit when it's in its container. I like to put on some gloves and use my hands for this part. This gives me the most control in placing the spackle. And you want a lot of control here that you just don't get with a spatula. I start spreading the spackle away from the track and slowly work my way up to it. Remember, we will be painting the spackle, so don't worry too much about the white. Right now, I am building up to the crossing, and you do want to be careful when you're doing this because it can be difficult to get off the track once you have it on there and it's dry. I personally feel comfortable edging the track freehand, but if you don't, I highly recommend just using some painter's tape to protect the track. It is also important that we get a solid base because we need to put the outer edges of those Blair line crossings into the spackle. So we're going to want to push the spackle right up to the outer edge of the rail. Now for this double crossing, we are going to have to spackle the middle section. And this is a tricky section, so you just need to be extra careful and mindful of where the spackle is going. Again, this is why I like using my hands versus a spatula. Lastly, I do the edge. Notice I'm not smoothing out the spackle too much here. This is because this will be done with sanding a lot later. Now it's time for the rest of the road. I generously apply spackle along the marked path of the road. I have two more crossings to build the road up to, and I use the same technique that I did before. When I get to the industrial areas, I simply apply spackle everywhere. The road boundaries can be accomplished with lines for this part. Once the spackle has begun to set, I place the outer beams of the crossings in the spackle next to the track. Remember to make these nice and snug up against the outer portion of the rail. A little bit of white glue to mix with the spackle also helps as well.
Now it's time to ballast the road bed. I will be using Arizona Rock and Minerals in scale Norfolk Southern CSX Bright Gray Ballast. This is my first time using Arizona Rock and Mineral Company, and I have to say that I am thoroughly impressed by the quality of their product. I start by laying a bead of white glue along the base of the track. I will say that ballasting Kato Unitrack is definitely one of the weak points and drawbacks of using Kato Track versus traditional track. It is more difficult. You'll notice that I'm not painting the track in this case. I didn't want to do that for this being a beginner type layout. If you would like to see a tutorial where I paint and ballast the track, I'll link that right up here. I dumped the ballast slowly along the middle of the track. I tap the bag to spread the ballast evenly. Next, I use a dry brush to spread the ballast and even it out. I brush some of the overspill back onto the roadbed and continue to poke and prod until I get the look that I want. Next, it's time to glue. Now in normal times, I would be using 70% or 90% isopropyl alcohol to release the surface tension before putting my 10 or 90 cement mixture on there. But with the pandemic, IPA is in short supply. So I will be using what's called wet water, which is water with a few drops of dish soap in it. This works the same, but can take up to several days to fully dry versus a matter of hours for IPA. I soak the ballast and then apply a 50-50 white glue water mixture to the track to glue it down. Ballasting is a tedious process and it is arguably one of the most tedious processes in building a model railroad, which is why I recommend breaking it up into working in sections. On this layout, I have broken up my sections based on the three grade crossings. Once everything has been glued in place, I leave it to dry, which may take a day or two in this case. Now I shift to the opposite side of the layout and paint the road. Now I've already sanded it smooth using a sanding sponge, and now I can paint it. I will be using simple black and gray spray paint. I do quick bursts of mist across the roads to get the desired effect, which means I need to cover up the track with painter's tape.
For the crossings, I only paint one side at a time to make it easier. And for the double crossing, I isolate the middle for painting. Now it's time to install the scenic base material. This is really where all of your vegetation and everything, this is the base it's going to sit on. I start with white glue in my work area. I then spread some dirt from Scenic Express, but you can actually make your own scenic dirt and I have done this and I'll link the tutorial. There's two things to notice here. First, notice my tapping motion for dispensing the dirt, and also notice that I poured a small amount of the dirt into the container's cap, and I used that to spread it slowly and evenly. Next, I do a light dusting of Woodland Scenic's burnt grass and dark green fine turf to make my scenic base. Then you soak it with either wet water or IPA, and then you apply your 50-50 white glue water mixture to it. Once the road is dried, I add a gravel transition point since my crossing on this side of the layout is going to be a gravel one. To place the gravel, you use the same technique to apply it. First glue, then the material, then you soak it with wet water, and then apply your 50-50 mixture to it. If you are using an airbrush instead of spray paint, be mindful of where the wet water runs, because it can make acrylic paint bleed. Of where I the then wet continue water adding the scenic base to various places lead. around the layout. Of in areas where the road is directly adjacent to the dirt, I put a small gravel threshold using a bead of white glue. Notice I have my buildings here for reference. This always helps with scenery. But now I have to take them off and paint all of the bases using Rust-Oleum's Aged Gray. Now for some wiring. Once everything has been really given time to dry, you'll go ahead and flip the layout on its side. We will be installing a bus for the 12 volt lights on this layout. We will be using the same EVE model bus we use for the DCC system. I like these because they have a DC plug and it makes wiring a little easier. I attach the bus, remembering to put spacers in between the bottom of the panel and the wood base. We are going to install lights for the building interiors. We will be controlling them with these switches. We will be installing four of these switches total for lights, so I started drilling the necessary holes with a 7 8 inch spade bit. I then put the switches in the corresponding holes I just drilled. I also install another bus, but this time it's for my lower voltage 5 volt lights, which will be my street lights. One good tip to remember is it's always good to try and clean up your workspace as you go. Now I feed the 12 volt LEDs into the holes we drilled in the first episode. Now normally I would solder these connections, but to keep it as simple as possible, I'm going with a solderless method for attaching wire. We will be twisting the wires together and sealing them with heat shrink tubing. 
I really like this wire because it comes with heat shrink tubing, zip ties, and even a wire stripper. I'll link it below. Once we strip the ends of the wires, we twist them together to attach all the necessary wires in the same fashion. We then slide our piece of heat shrink tubing over the connection and then use a heat gun to seal it up. If you don't have a heat gun, a grill lighter works great for this. Just be mindful of where the flame is so that you don't melt any wire or catch any wood on fire. I then repeat the process for all of the wires. For the wiring setup, you see three wires from the switches. One is the overall power and one powers the LED indicator in the switch. These both need to be connected to the red side of the bus. The black wire of the switch then hooks up to the red end of the LEDs we are using for building lights. We then connect the black wires of the LEDs to the black side of the power bus. And this is done all using the same wire attachment technique. Remember to do a rough pre-measurement of your wire before you cut so that you have the right amount. Once all of the lights are wired up, we can give them a test. And you can see that all of my lights turn on. We start this episode by installing the bases of the buildings and we're going to use white glue to do this in case we either make a mistake or we need to do something else and make a change. That way they're easy to remove. We then use double-sided tape to place the buildings while we work on the layout. You can also use this method for permanent installation if you don't intend to move your layout around. I have a detailed tutorials on how I paint and detail several of these buildings and I will link them below. Now one thing I did forget to do earlier when I was doing scenery was to put on a rock face and it was my original intention to simply buy some pre-made faces, but I want to try a new method. I use a tool to chip away randomly at the foam base until I get an organic rocky shape that I like. I then use a sanding sponge to smooth it out. Now I tape the track to protect it and spray Rust-Oleum Gray Primer as the base color. So I let that dry and while it was drying, I go ahead and begin covering the hillside with a tree canopy. I am making puffball trees for this, which I consider the most cost effective way to cover a hillside with a tree canopy. I have gone into detail with puffball trees in another tutorial and I will link that below. This is a time consuming and messy process, so I highly recommend wearing gloves while you do this. Now that the trees are in place and the rocks have dried, we can detail them. I will be using the dry brush method. This is where you take a brush, dab it in some paint, and then remove most of the paint back off of it by brushing it against a surface. Then you paint over the surface that you're detailing with a mostly dry brush, hence the name. This puts very little paint on it and accentuates the highlights and details of the surface. Now before we continue, I am going to do a little cleanup. Now it's time to install some detail lighting, in this case, street lights. You may need to lift up your building bases and drill larger holes for the wires. And this is why we used white glue in the first place to secure down our buildings in case we needed to adjust something. Next, we thread the wires through the bases. If you need to lift the bases out, that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. 
I was able to guide the wires through the base with little trouble. But if you're having issues, sticking a tiny stir straw through the hole and then cutting it to size and threading the wire through it is a great way to easily run wire through the base. As you can see, I did have to remove most of the bases for this, which is why I'm glad I used white glue versus something stronger to secure them in the first place. Now we flipped our table up and we can wire the lights. We will be hooking up all of our lights to our 5 volt bus we installed in an earlier video. We still need resistors though, so make sure that you install a 1K resistor somewhere along the wiring of each light. We will be using the heat shrink tubing method to connect all the wires that I did in a previous tutorial for this layout. Once we wired everything up, we go ahead and plug in our 5 volt power supply and do a quick test. It looks like all of our lights are working, so we can begin to seal up all of the lights and all of the other wires and then connect the switch that will control them. I use hot glue applied to the wire holes to seal them in. This will lessen the chance of the wires being pulled and snapped off. We are going to wire up the 5 volt bus switch a little differently than we did the 12 volt bus. We want the switch to control the entire bus, so we will be inserting the switch into the main power line to the 5 volt bus. To do this, we will be using one of these DC terminal adapter jacks. We start by hooking both of our red feeders from the switch into the positive side of the terminal jack. We then connect a white wire to the black switch feeder and a green wire to the negative terminal jack from the DC plug. We use the heat shrink tube method to secure it all in place. I am using different colors so that it's easy to disseminate which one is the main power and which one is the power that goes to each individual light. The white then attaches to the red screw terminal on the bus and the green attaches to the black screw terminal. We then plug the power into the terminal jack and we're done with the lights. Now it's time to prep the buildings for their roofs. We place some tissue paper around the lights in the buildings. This will help diffuse the light and make it look like it's coming from more than one window. Now we glue our roofs on. This is done using simple super glue. Now with all of the buildings in place, I can finally put the rest of the scenic base in that I started in part three of this series. Now it's time for one of my favorite parts, which is installing trees. Trees can bring a railroad to life. I will be using several different types of trees, including ones that I bought and ones that I've made myself using seafoam. I have made several tutorials on trees and I will link those below. I use a small awl to punch holes in the foam for the trees. I then apply a dot of white glue before securing the tree in the hole. I like to either place trees in groups of three to five or place them by themselves. I also stick some trees into my hillside to help blend the hillside itself in a little bit. Now 
Next, I go to detail the streets. I'm using a method that I've gone over in a previous tutorial, and that is cutting electrical tape into narrow strips and placing it by hand. I'll link this below. This allows for easy placement and replacement until I get the lines just right. When I go over a grade crossing, I lay the tape over it and then cut it afterwards. For any white lines, I use an identical method. While I like to do most things DIY, I absolutely love the signs from Titchy Train Group. They are very detailed and reasonably priced. I have them linked below. I install them by drilling a small hole with my pin vise and then applying a drop of white glue and then sticking the sign in place. Now I go to make the road lines permanent. I do this by painting a thin coat of Mod Podge matte medium over the lines. Once it dries, the tape will be sealed in. Next, we go to apply some additional vegetation. I place white glue in various locations and sprinkle Woodland Scenics coarse turf over it to get a brushy undergrowth effect. I then seal it up using either IPA or wet water and my 50-50 white glue water mixture. I then place a few beads of the 50-50 mixture and some clump foliage down to simulate larger bushes. Next, it's time to do a little bit of weathering. I use pastels that I've ground up on a piece of sandpaper. I have shown how to do this in a previous tutorial and I'll link that below. I also weather the sidewalks. The colors I used for painting didn't end up matching, but that's okay. A lot of times concrete doesn't look uniform, so weathering it to appear that it has been there a while even though it's different colors will actually make it look a little bit more realistic. Another detail I include are cars. I install a few of these cars that I bought online. They're not the most detailed things in the world, but they're affordable, and I apply them using white glue. The last detail I add is a few figures. These I found online and I will link below. I put a dab of white glue and then place the figure's feet in the glue. I use these tiny clothespins to hold the figures up while they dry. Notice I put the clothespins in the middle of the figure so that it does not go into the glue and the clip gets glued onto the base. MRR1 is a 2 foot by 4 foot in scale layout. 
It is capable of being an independent layout as well as a module of a larger layout. It has two sidings for industries and all of the buildings are 100% 3D printed. There are loads of details. The track is Kato Unitrack with a minimum radius of 9.75 inches. It's also designed to be ready for expansion. and has the capability of handling six axle diesels. MRR1 is also wired for night running with building and street lights. All of the electronics are DIY with a DCC++ base station powered by a Raspberry Pi with the JMRI Linux disk image. I even added this combination HDMI and USB jack after the fact to make it easier to hook up a monitor, keyboard, and mouse. MRR1 is designed to be portable and fit in most anyone's available space. All right, you knew that I wasn't just going to be like, here it is. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do a little op session to show you guys how I run MRR1 as a railroad. Not necessarily totally prototypical, but it's a lot of fun. MRR1 has two sidings for industries and each one is capable of holding two cars. NS7138 will be our switcher today. This is a Fox Valley Models Jeep 60 with a Digitrax decoder. We start by pulling up to the industries. We first uncouple the train with the first two deliveries still attached. These will go at industry number one. I will be using the first two cars as a handle for positioning purposes. I then pull the deliveries out and attach them onto my train. The locomotive then repositions to pull the other two cars out. These have to be moved one at a time because of space.
The locomotive then runs around the loop to the end of the train. MRR1 is designed so that the loop functions as a passing siding. It's not a perfect space saving solution, but it works well when it's used in concert with the other sidings. Once the pickups have been attached to the end of the train, the locomotive runs back around. We temporarily spot two of the drop-offs at industry number one that we won't need. We reattach the train, then head around to do some creative train movements. Here we have what is either the main line or a siding depending how you run this railroad. We will be using this to store some cars temporarily. We can place cars on this siding two at a time. Once we have the cars stored temporarily, we head back to spot the first two deliveries in their proper location. We first pull them back out, then run around them and place them one at a time on the siding. Now we can head back to where we have the other cars temporarily spotted and retrieve the first two cars for the delivery at industry number one. Remember when we pulled them out at first and then attached them to our train? We did that for blocking purposes to make this move easier.
Once we have those deliveries dropped off, we can head back to the shop. So that's MRR1, guys. I had an absolute blast building this railroad. It was an absolute ton of fun to build. And if you guys go ahead and give this a try to build, be sure to send me some pictures. You can email them to me in the email in the description below. Now, I want to say a quick thank you to Mammoth Headwear, our sponsor. They have sent me this hat to try out, and I absolutely love it being a big-headed guy. And you can check them out at the link in the description below. If you use that link, that is an affiliate link, and I do get a small kickback on that. So thank you guys so much for watching. Special thank you to all of my patrons. They are listed right here. If you would like to become a patron, you can for as little as $1 a month. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, I'm Jimmy from the DIY and Digital. Stay safe, be kind, and happy railroading.